when Team Green steals your sweet roll, you gotta suit up and strike back. And that's exactly what AMD did in 2012 with the Radeon HD 7970GHz edition. While NVIDIA's GTX 680 narrowly beat the original HD 7970, it only took AMD two months to release their counterattack. The Gigahertz edition was essentially a binned and overclocked HD 7970. It was also the first AMD card to introduce PowerTune with Boost, or AMD's version of GPU Boost. This led to a 13% higher GPU clock and a 9% memory clock increase over the base 7970. All of these enhancements only led to a narrow win over the GTX 680, but it was enough to crown the Gigahertz edition the fastest single GPU of its time. And it didn't stop there. That small performance gap continued to grow substantially over time. So today we'll be benchmarking this card in 10 modern titles, and testing power consumption as well. The card we're looking at today is an engineering sample using AMD's reference design. The majority of Gigahertz editions were built using custom AIB cooling solutions, which are preference as this reference cooler has a hard time coping with the increased voltage and clock speeds. This card is still in use, so its TIM has already been replaced and the card has already been cleaned. It uses the same vapor chamber heatsink that's found on the base 7970, and it's rather heavy compared to any cards we've tested thus far. The card also has two BIOSes on board, so you can flash a custom BIOS on the card if you like. The stock core frequency on this card is 1 GHz, but after boost kicks in it rises to 1050 MHz. The memory is clocked at 1500 MHz, which is 6000 MHz effective. Now Tahiti based GPUs are well known for their overclocking prowess, and this GPU is no exception. This card will do 1300 MHz on the core in synthetic benchmarks, but it's not game stable. So for stability reasons we stuck with 1200 MHz as it's rock solid at 1.25 volts. And it's still a 14% improvement over its stock boost clock. Unfortunately the memory on this card isn't that great at all, as it only likes clocking up to 1600 MHz. I've had it up to 1650 in some games, but it's not game stable for all the games we tested today. We'll also be keeping the fan on auto with our stock testing, and then ramping it up to 70% for our overclock. And FYI, it's loud. Alright, well let's jump into some game testing and see how this card performs today. The first game up is Doom, and using the Vulcan API with the Ultra preset, we averaged 89 frames per second. Overclocked, we jumped up 11% to 99. Frame times were amazing, though there was an anomaly at the start of our run, and that's probably due to the capture tool that we're using, but it doesn't affect our overall numbers. Playing this game was a beautiful, super smooth experience, all thanks to the Vulcan API. The Witcher 3 is up next, and using the medium preset with no hair works and all post-processing enabled, we saw an average of 61 frames per second. Overclocked, that number rose 9% to 67. Frame times were good, and we didn't experience any stutter, but there was a large drop in frame rate when entering a certain section of Novigrad, as shown in our graph. This drop was repeatable and noticeable in our stock and overclock runs. The ever popular PUBG is up next, and using the medium preset at 100% resolution scale, we saw 50 frames per second on average. During our 7.5 minute capture, we only experienced a handful of noticeable stutters, as shown on screen. For a game that still needs further optimization, it's not a bad result. And also, for those interested, I'll be uploading a separate video using competitive graphics settings. Hellblade Sessua's Sacrifice is up next, and here we're using the high preset at 1080p. We averaged 52 frames per second, and overclocked that number jumped up 9% to 57. Throughout our 2 minute capture, we experienced very consistent frame times, however there was a very small section of our capture that would cause stutter consistently, as shown on screen. This was tested numerous times and was repeatable every time. Overwatch is up next, and using the Ultra preset with 100% resolution scale, we saw 98 frames per second on average. Overclocked, that number rose 9% to 107. Frame times were amazing and the game never dropped below 60 FPS in our capture. A very smooth experience. I fired up the Forza 7 demo next, and here we're using the Ultra Render preset with everything set to high along with 2x MSAA. We averaged 55 frames per second and overclocked that number increased 9% to 60. Frame times appeared to have a lot of spikes, 
but most were all below an 8 millisecond swing. Despite that, our gameplay of the Dubai track did not feel smooth compared to the other tracks in the demo. Early reports suggest this game has some issues with CPU utilization, and it also has a 60 FPS cap. I hope the kinks get worked out before official release, as this game is beautiful to behold. GTA 5 is up next, and with everything set to very high with FXAA, we averaged 84 frames per second. Overclocked that number increased 7% to 90. Frame times were rather good throughout, though in our 115 second capture of the built-in benchmark, we did experience a single noticeable stutter. This was repeatable and experienced in the same result in our stock and overclock settings. Rainbow Six Siege is the next game we tested, and using the built-in benchmark with the Ultra Graphics preset, we averaged 96 frames per second. Overclocked, that number rose 11% to 107. Frame times were excellent and the game was more than playable at 1080p. Fallout 4 is up next, and using the high preset with TAA and 16XAF, we averaged 73 frames per second. Overclocked, that number rose 9% to 80. Frame times were pretty good, but we did experience some pretty hard drops to our frame rates outside of certain areas of Diamond City. The last game we tested today was Mass Effect Andromeda, and using the high preset we averaged 39 frames per second. Overclocked that number jumped up 10% to 43. Frame times were excellent in our gameplay capture, though during some of the cutscenes we did experience some stutters. This game is rather demanding, so tweaking the graphics options further down is a must if you're wanting to approach that 60 FPS mark. Now let's take a look at power consumption. To test this we fired up The Witcher 3 and allowed the card to stabilize at its max temperature. At stock clock speeds the card topped out at 79C and the entire system pulled 318 watts from the wall. After factoring in PSU efficiency the entire system consumed roughly 270 watts. While the card did stabilize at 79C with an ambient of 26C, I have seen it sit at 81C with a slightly higher ambient. Moving on to our overclock results, we saw the card top out at 69 to 70 C, and this was with manually setting the fan to 70%. Power consumption rose 8% to 344 watts, and after PSU efficiency, the entire system was roughly consuming 292 watts. While Tahiti cards are temperature sensitive when overclocking, we could have dropped the fan speed down a bit to help with the noise. At 70% fan speed, this card's noise level was on par with the GTX 480 we recently tested. So as we start to wrap things up, I will say I was a bit underwhelmed with the performance scaling of our overclocks. However, our mediocre memory overclocks, along with our above average core clock, was probably holding us back from scaling a bit better. Still a 9-10% to gain from overclocking is pretty standard for most cards these days. Looking at 1080p performance, you can see the Gigahertz Edition still holds up very well. While some games played great with high and ultra settings, others will need to be dropped to medium settings in order to maintain that 60 FPS on average. Now the results shown here would pretty much be in line with the R9 280X, as it's pretty much a rebadged Gigahertz edition with slightly lower core clocks. Also, if you're an owner of an HD 7950 or an R9 280, overclocking your car to 1150 MHz on the core and 1500 MHz on the memory would give you around the same results as this stock Gigahertz edition. Frame time delivery was quite good, and we only experienced a couple issues here and there. I would say overall the card performed very well, and while its power consumption isn't great, it still has a place in PC gaming today, and that's why I still keep it in a secondary gaming system. If you enjoyed content like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel. I also wanted to give a shout out to Oopy Doopy for going out of his way to plug my channel on a Digital Foundry video. While I would never ask anyone to do this, it's still very much appreciated. And as always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. F2F out.